someone doesn't have to be out in the woods too long to feel like I might not belong here and something is going to take me out. I've been a journalist for about 25 years, embedding with street gangs, going undercover as a neo-Nazi skinhead. And I'm going to tell you the craziest story I've ever heard. I was working on a cannabis farm up in Northern California. I remember a guy telling me about three bodies torn to pieces. He said, a Bigfoot killed those guys. A Bigfoot murdered three guys on a dope farm. There's always been rumors of legendary violence. The story of Sasquatch or of man-like monsters has been with us from the very beginning. There's a belief in supernatural forces that runs deeper up here than most places. You believe that Sasquatch can teleport? And no. Uh, yes, you do. No, I yes, do you not. Do. You do. Do not go there. The Emerald Triangle is famous worldwide for producing cannabis plants. It's just the best in the world. People came here to get rich quick. They don't want outside or something. The rate of missing persons cases is the highest in the United States by far. Old time cannabis growers are willing to sit down and talk to me, but there's no way they're ever gonna go on camera. Plenty of people have been killed up there and never found. I'm venturing into dangerous territory with all these hippies listening to the Grateful Dead, but packing an AR-15. We probably have more bodies than we could even count. It's pretty bad. Tell me about the crime that your son witnessed. I really can't talk about that. People pass through here, and they just see how beautiful it is. They have no idea the shit that goes on in this area. As scary as some of these stories are, we still want to figure it out. People are afraid of the unknown. The evidence convinces me that Sasquatch is dangerous. It scared the crap out of me. I don't know if I believe in Bigfoot, but I sure as hell believe there are monsters among us. It looked like somebody was bent over and had their head in the window of the deer blind. It either heard me or smelt me, and he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up, and that, that shocked me. They don't make people that, that big. The way it moved, almost as if it was gliding across the beach. I've never seen anything move like that in my life. They were screaming at each other in gibberish. It sounded like a language and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. I know what a bear looks like and there is no way on this planet that what I saw were bears. from East Tennessee, and you're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you. Uh, we're going to be chatting with Rob. And Rob comes to us from Canada. He's actually a veteran, and he's had a couple very strange things happen to him out in the woods, including two sightings of the creature. Uh, so he'll be sharing that with us tonight. We're also going to be chatting with Joshua Ruffay, and he's a director of the new project coming out of Hulu. It's a documentary. It's called Sasquatch. And so we'll be talking about the film and the whole project that and why he got into it. Uh, if you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. 
And if you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Well, let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome uh, Joshua Rofe to the show. And Josh is the director of this Hulu project called Sasquatch. It comes out on 420, so in two days. Uh, and I really hope everyone goes and checks it out. I have to tell you, Josh, I've been to Hollywood. Don't take offense to this. I've been to Hollywood. I've talked to executive producers. I've talked to directors. And I there's not a creative bone in mo- in most of them. Um, it, they're all bean counters and you know this it, so with regard to Sasquatch you know I've watched almost everything I kind of drown in this world of Bigfoot as you can imagine but your project was very different it was very cool uh, the way it was put together the way it was shot the the creativity on how the whole thing was shot the the content that was involved and the presentation it was awesome man it, I mean I clicked it on and I kind of dragged my feet on on watching it because I was like, eh, I'm not really interested in watching another B horror film with Bigfoot because they're terrible. You know, I thought, well, after two minutes, if I'm not interested, I'll just turn it off. And I sat and watched all three episodes in one sitting, and I was very, very impressed. It's very cool. It's very different. Um, it has a different feel to it. I guess if you love a murder mystery and you love just a mystery in general. It's so well put together. I can't tell you how impressed I was. And I'm not saying that because you're here. It, it, you know, I would have you on for two minutes if I wasn't impressed and we'd promote your thing and I'd, I'd see you later. But I, I really want to talk to you about it because it was so well put together. And I was so impressed by this documentary. Again, Sasquatch comes out on Hulu on 420. Everyone go check it out. Uh, amazing job, Josh. Thank you for that, Wes. I really appreciate that. It's, you know, I, I am, I know I'm, I'm here, you know, I'm the director. So I, you know, I put that in, you know, put that in quotes if you want. I'm the director, but I don't make these things alone. I, I've got an amazing team that I work with. And so it's really, it, it's, it's all of us just giving it everything we have to, to try and make, make something uh, that, that is compelling. So it's really awesome to, to hear you say that. And I'm a, I am a huge Sasquatch Chronicles fan, um, and I know we'll probably get into that as it's really the show. I mean, your show was in many ways my inspiration for wanting to pursue, you know, what I would refer to as, you know, just some sort of Sasquatch centric uh, story even. So very, very cool to be on here. And, and, and thanks for those words. I appreciate it. Yeah. And thank you again, Josh, for being here. Uh, you know, one of the things that really impressed me when I was watching beyond just getting wrapped up into this whole murder mystery and the mystery of Sasquatch and everything else. One thing that really impressed me when I was watching it, I was sitting there thinking, wow, these guys really know the topic of Sasquatch. I mean, these guys have done their homework um, and it's so well put together. What made you create a documentary about Sasquatch? Because I know it's kind of out of your wheelhouse. Yes, I, I can tell you exactly how and when. So February 2018, I was having dinner with a, with a buddy. His name's Zach Kreger, and Zach he's also one of the exec producers on on this show. So Zach is a huge Sasquatch Chronicles fan. And Zach's jealous that I'm on this today, and he's and he's not here with me. That I can guarantee you. But he he loves. He's a huge fan of this show, and his parting words to me after our dinner were, "Hey, by the way, you got to listen to this podcast, Sasquatch Chronicles. I love it. I think it's incredible." You're either going to love it or think I'm crazy for loving it, but just give it a listen. I'm not going to BS you, Wes, right away. I, when he told me that, I had no interest. I'm not a monster movie guy. I, I, I just, I was not, I mean, granted, I, drew, I grew up in New Jersey and, you know, there was a certain amount of fear of the Jersey devil that, that I had as a kid in camp, you know, in the Pine Barrens, but cryptids were just not my thing. And he said, and, you know, Zach basically said, I'm telling you, just, just listen to one episode. And so the next day I listened to an episode cut to four days later, I've listened to 11 episodes. And the thing that struck me in all of these stories was uh, visceral fear was present. It was so clear that the fear that I was feeling from these people telling their stories, it was authentic. And I, I felt that it was unquestionably authentic. Uh, you know, does someone believe in Bigfoot? 
Do they believe the details of a story? Those things really were sort of irrelevant to me. I knew that I believed these people because because I believe that they were afraid. And that really struck me. You know, I thought there was some something really, really, really profound and, and, and deep there. And so I, I spent the next week just sort of having a conversation with myself, which is I got to make a Sasquatch something. I don't know what it is. And then there was another part of me that thought, you're, you're not a you're not a Sasquatch guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's not your thing. You make social issue documentaries that, you know, what, you know, what are you talking about? And where I landed at the end of that week was I am going to tell a story that is somehow set in the world of, you know, of, of Bigfoot. And then my next thought was, well, what if I found a murder mystery that is somehow intertwined with a Sasquatch story? There's obviously a ton of true crime out there. And a lot of it does feel sort of tired. Um, and there's, you know, there's tropes that uh, have become tropes because just we see them time and time again. And I felt like this, if I could find this story, I thought, God, that would be really, it, it could be something fresh and unique. What I would hope is that I could find a story that could capture a sort of even next level spirit of that, that visceral fear that I was sensing from, from, from the folks that you were talking to. And so I reached out to uh, a friend and colleague. Uh, his name is David Holthouse, and he's been an investigative journalist for about 20 years. On top of being an investigative journalist, David uh, spent years as a gonzo journalist. I mean, really hardcore, deep, deep, dangerous worlds. He was immerse, immersing himself. And so I, I sent David a text message, and I said, I said, hey, man, this is the craziest text I'm going to send you for the next five years. I want to find a murder mystery that's somehow wrapped up in a Sasquatch story. And if it exists, pursue it as the next project. He wrote me right back. He said, I love it. I got one and I'll call you in five. And then what he proceeds to tell me is that in the fall of 1993, he was uh, 23 years old. He was living in Anchorage, Alaska. That's where he's from. And he was a young gonzo journalist really sort of burning it at both ends, learning the hard way that not everybody gets to be Hunter S. Thompson. And he was writing a story about some street gangs that he was embedded with. And he had gotten crosswise with some folks. And even local law enforcement told him, hey, man, you, you might want to leave town for a little bit until this settles down. And so David, David reached out to a friend of his uh, who was working on a, on a cannabis farm in Northern California, uh, out in Mendocino County. And, you know, he told him what was going on. And his buddy who was working on, on, on the cannabis farm said, hey, why don't you come out here? You'll spend a week. You'll smoke great weed, take some mushrooms and trip in the woods. I promise you will go back refreshed. And, you know, the 23-year-old David, that sounded amazing. So he heads out that way, flies down from Anchorage, grabs a car, and starts to make his way up to... Uh, to, out to Mendocino. And the first omen was, was that it was pouring rain. I mean, he could barely see out of the front windshield. Then he gets to the farm. He notices that you can cut through the tension with a knife. It was truly palpable. Everybody is setting up booby traps on the perimeter of this, of this cannabis farm, of the patches of, uh, of weed. And there are whispers of violent Sasquatch in the area. There are also people who are guarding these patches who are carrying automatic rifles. And so his idea of some sort of, you know, very chill vibe that he was going to go and, and waltz into to sort of unplug for a little bit, you know, that was quickly dismantled. And he, he saw that this, this, was, this was a level of intensity, almost absurdity that he, he wasn't prepared for. He didn't know how to make heads or tails of it. Um, but he was just trying to go with the flow. The second night he was there, he was in the A-frame cabin owned by the owner of the cannabis farm. They were watching Monday Night Football. They were smoking a joint. It was David, his buddy who he was visiting, and the owner of the farm. And all of a sudden, the phone rings. The owner of the farm picks up the phone, mutters a few things back and forth. Seems there's a little bit of urgency in his voice. David doesn't think anything of it. Homer sits back down, 
they keep watching Monday Night Football. About 15, 20 minutes later, the headlights of a car shine through the front windows of this A-frame. And keep in mind, this cabin is in the middle of the woods. There are no, there are no street lights. Uh, it's still pouring rain. And these two guys come in and they are terrified. They are exasperated. And, and, you know, they're basically freaking out. They eventually get the words out to the owner. And what they tell the owner that David hears them say is that a little bit further up the mountain on another weed farm, there was a murder and it was a triple murder. And there were three guys who were found quite literally torn limb from limb. And all the eyewitnesses had the same account. And that was that either a Sasquatch or multiple Sasquatch came out of the woods and ripped these guys to pieces. And the body parts, because the first thought would be like, oh, well, of course, you know, some people did that. Well, guess what? This is a, this is a world where, you know, money rules everything, right? Um, that's the whole reason to, to, grow, to grow the product. Well, the body parts were found tossed amongst what was literally worth two hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars. This patch of weed, and and it was and and the weed was left untouched, and so that was the story that that David told me uh, that he heard that I I don't want to I don't want to mischaracterize it as it haunted him for the next you know twenty six years or whatever it was till I reached out, but it it was it immediately became the wildest story he'd ever heard. It was a story that was sort of so intense and so extreme that even he, a gonzo journalist, did not feel comfortable going to the editor of his various newspapers uh, or publications that he worked for over the years and say, and, you know, and, and say, hey, what, what if I went and wrote about this? It was, that, it was that, that type of story that you just don't tell anybody else because they're going to tell you you're crazy. And then, and as soon as he told me that, I just... Number one, I thought it was I thought it was the greatest story I'd ever heard. I thought it was one of the most compelling things anybody had ever told me, and uh, and I knew that, that that was something that that I wanted to pursue and and attempt to to make a documentary about. I think you it wasn't it was a little more than an attempt. I think you pretty much hit a home run on it, and I was so impressed by it when I was watching it. You kind of, from my perspective, and people who love Sasquatch Chronicles will definitely love this. And I think a lot of my audience will kind of understand why the creatures came out and probably killed these guys based on what they were doing. Uh, but you have to watch the show to understand that. I, I know my audience will pick, probably pick up on it really quick. With regard to David, I was sitting there watching him. Uh, David Holthouse, the investigative journalist that's on the show, man, the guy's got huge balls. Um, one of the things, there's a lot of suspense because he starts talking to a lot of people in that underworld that he needs to be careful talking to. And he starts asking questions he might want to be careful asking. And then he goes out and he meets these people. There was a lot of times where I thought David's going to end up without his head. That was a, a huge part of our experience. You know, what, what you experienced watching those moments, they, hap they were happening time and time again over the course of a couple of years of making this. And you know, one of the things he mentions in uh, episode two is doing this sort of constant risk analysis, you know, when, when he is stepping into a situation, when he's talking to people, when he's considering what information should I or should I not release publicly? What's the potential fallout here? And, you know, he always said that the line is short of getting killed. And sometimes, you don't know that you're touching that line and it's, and it's too late. And that was a real concern throughout this because he, he truly entered what could be described um, as the criminal underworld deep in the forest, up in the mountains. And, you know, there's no cell service in those places and nobody, no, nobody knows where to come look for you if you go missing. And it was, it, it was scary. It was scary. There, there were a lot of times, Wes, where David would go meet with a potential source. They would change the location on him multiple times. And that's a bad sign. I mean, that's super sketchy. Because now you're meeting at 3 o'clock p.m. in a public place. Well, now it's, now it's 11 p.m. Um, and the place that you're going to meet that person is, you, you don't know this, but it's closed. And when you walk in, 
there's the person you were going to meet and eight other people you didn't even know were going to be there. And these meetings, they go on. They're a few hours deep. People are having some drinks. People are eating some food. People are talking. And then they turn to David and they say, hey, so you're looking into X, Y, and Z. And, um, oh, you should talk to a buddy of mine. Uh, well, let's call him right now. Somebody gets on the phone. And he says, you know what? I know all about that. Why don't you come out and see me? And David says, yeah, I'd, I'd love to. You know, what are you doing? Are you free tomorrow? And they said, no, I'm, uh, now. Why don't you come now? And then, a guy, and then the guy standing next to him will say, I'll drive you. And we're talking about being offered to be driven somewhere else, deep in the woods, three hours away in the middle of the night, and you have no idea where the hell you're going. It, it, was, it was a lot of that. So when you start to mix that element with the, the, the visceral fear of the Sasquatch element um, and some of the stories that, that people have out there, it's just, uh, it's just, you know, it's kind of like a graphic novel come to life in a way. Um, but you just gotta be, you gotta be so careful. You gotta be so careful. Yeah. There was a few times where I thought David was going to get whacked, uh, just watching him go out to these different locations and talk to these people, um, on the phone and, and just getting involved in that underworld. Uh, there's definitely a lot of suspense watching David, but watching the whole story unfold. And what's cool is you watch the documentary and it's about this murder mystery, but there's takeaways. You'll take away and kind of tell a history of Sasquatch. Bob Gimlin's in there. Uh, you'll kind of tell different aspects of of Sasquatch and kind of a history of Sasquatch along with eyewitnesses, which is even cooler because a murder mystery is enough, but all the rest of the stuff is kind of icing on the cake. I got to ask you, are you guys going to make another one? You got to make another one, man. You know, I think if enough people who listen to Sasquatch Chronicles tell Hulu that they that they that they want more episodes, then uh, that then, then maybe that maybe they'll let me make them. You know, I think that I I know this. I you know, even this story aside, there there's a number of stories that uh, that I think are really interesting in the in this sort of realm uh, that I can tell in a, sim a similar fashion that that I'm ver very much. Uh, very much thinking about um it's there's so much more to the world of you know folklore and cryptids than the average person would think you know i i knew when i was making this that that people who who are uh believers or enthusiasts you know of of cryptids of folklore i knew that they i knew they'd be into it because it speaks to that thing that they already know is super is super interesting you know and is really it's just it, it the, the world i mean it's why your show is great it it is a rich tapestry you have so many different people from all walks of life who have experiences that scared the hell out of them and now what happens if you really start to to dig into some of these things are they all going to yield something that should be a, a documentary series of course not but some of them will and I think that uh, I, I think it's a world that I, I, I really want to continue to, to to explore and and see what other boundaries we can push. Yeah, I really hope that you get put in a position to do more, Josh. And I hope the audience does contact Hulu. I'll be contacting Hulu and asking them for more. You know, it comes out on April 20th on Hulu. So in two days, definitely check it out. It's called Sasquatch. And, you know, the whole project, it's almost like you've been putting together Sasquatch documentaries your whole life. It was that well put together. And I know I've, I've been praising you on it, but it's so, and the audience will understand when they watch it, it's very, very different than any Sasquatch documentary you've ever seen. And I wanted to ask you, Josh, this being outside of your wheelhouse, and forgive me, I, I don't generally watch a lot of TV. Tell me about some of your other projects, because as I was watching this, I was sitting there thinking... I got to see what else this guy's done. Oh, thanks, man. I really appreciate that. Um, well, my first documentary was called Lost for Life. You can see that on either Amazon or iTunes. It, it's about juveniles who are serving life in prison without parole, all convicted of first-degree murders. A, a, a pretty harrowing story of, of, of these kids. Well, they were once kids. They're now adults who had committed really brutal murders. 
when uh, when they were teenagers. I, th- I think you can go on YouTube also. I think it's I think it's on there too. And then my second film, this one I know is only available on, on through either iTunes or Amazon. It's called Swift Current, and it tells the story of a, a former NHL player named Sheldon Kennedy who he was um, he was sexually abused by his junior hockey coach, who was one of the most respected men in, in junior hockey at the time. It's it's Sheldon's story about his recovery from from that type of trauma. And then just before this, sort of the thing the thing that was really I guess you can call it my big break was I, I made a documentary series uh, for Amazon called Lorena, and uh, did that one with Jordan Peele, who made Get Out and Us. That story is about the story of Lorena Bobbitt. And, you know, everybody knows that story as the crazy lady who cut her husband's penis off and threw it out the car window, right? Yeah. But really, that story is about, is about a woman who she was beaten and raped uh, for years by him. And, and, and before she, before she did that. And so, you know, what we tried to do was recontextualize the story of, of this victim of horrific trauma who had become really, she was turned into a p- total punchline by the media and everybody should have been talking about domestic violence and how serious that, that issue is. And instead they, you know, everybody just essentially made fun of her. And so we, we we recontextualized that story and um, and, and gave you the gave you the, the 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 real the real story. It's four episodes. It's on it's on Amazon. Um, that's what I was making when I first heard this story from David. David was working on Lorena with me. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to check that out, Josh. I knew the story of Lorena Bobbitt. I didn't know her backstory. I think everyone knows the Lorena Bobbitt story of how she ended up in prison. Um, but I'm definitely have to check that out. I think that's what makes the Sasquatch documentary you put together so cool is you had these fresh eyes. You didn't come from, you haven't spent time in the quote unquote Bigfoot community or Bigfoot world. And I can tell you from firsthand when you're dealing with not so much the eyewitnesses, but when you're dealing with these researchers and experts and it can be very soul sucking at times. And I think the fact that you didn't come from that, you kind of had fresh eyes, is what makes this documentary so cool. You know, I just did a show uh, on Sasquatch and their language, and I, it, I, I I saw that one pop. I haven't listened to that one yet, but I literally this morning I saw that one pop on for my, uh, my you know the new episodes of my various podcasts. Yeah, I, I saw that that popped up. Sorry, go ahead. I appreciate. It. I hope you give it a give it a listen, but. Uh, Claire's in Cal- there's a woman that came from uh, the UK to to the United States. She was on, here on business, and she was pretty high up in the business food chain world. She was in technology, and on her off time, she went out to oh uh, the beach. You've probably heard it five fifteen. Uh, I kind of West, West, West. That's one of my that's one of my favorites. That's oh, one of my favorites from the show. I, I that, appreciate it, man. Oh yeah, yeah. no, I lo- I love that episode. That's one of my favorite episodes. Yeah, I appreciate that, man. I appreciate that very much. Uh, Claire's Encounter, yeah, it could be made into a very cool episode. There's a lot of different aspects to Claire's Encounter, uh, you know, from language to injuries to a cover-up. And there is a cover-up going on regarding this topic. Um, And you get a glimpse of that in Claire's Encounter. With regard to what you did, Josh, you, I, with your talent, I think you could pretty much do anything. I'm sure you don't want to do Sasquatch the rest of your life. But it would be very cool if Hulu picked it up because there's a lot more content. And if you need content, give me a call. Uh, there's a lot of different avenues and directions you can take this subject. And just how you, again, I can't, I know if I'm repeating myself, but the way you put put this together, the way you came in and out of shots, the creativity you used to putting it together, I really want Hulu to do another another season of this. I got to see more. <laughs> the, the, Wes, that is really uh, amazing to hear. And you know, as as far as the 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 history of Sasquatch as it relates to the you know the, whether it's the Patterson Gimlin film or even just. You know, just culturally, um, you know, what what is it to be a squatcher? You know what I mean? What is it to be a part of a community? That was something that I wanted to, you know, sort of at, at least attempt to gain some understanding of before before embarking on this. And so 
I mentioned Zach Kreger earlier. So Zach and Steven Berger, who's my producing partner, we went to the, uh, the it was one of the Bigfoot conventions in, in Kennewick, Washington. And it was in, I believe it was in August, 2018. And actually I should say that Sam Kreger, who was Zach's brother, Sam was the one who told Zach, hey, you got to check out this podcast, Sasquatch Chronicles, even even further back. And Sam, he came out and met us there. And, you know, we just spent a couple, we, we met you. You were awesome, by the way. We didn't know who the hell we were. You treated us uh, like r- really, you know, so kindly with your time. Obviously, a lot of people wanted to talk to you. Um, you know, Mr. Gimlin, the same thing. And getting to see people get together in a, in a community where, hey, you know what? The outside world, it doesn't always look too kindly on this. It doesn't always take this seriously. People laugh at certain, certain beliefs that people have. But all of a sudden, you're in a place where everybody is tr- being treated. Everybody's beliefs, um, and those beliefs on Sasquatch can even be different, right? But everybody's beliefs are being treated with dignity and respect. And you realize very quickly, at least I did, just how special this is. And this is not something that can be easily dismissed. This is something that, um, Sasquatch aside, it has a lot of humanity and the, the sort of the connection that, that people have around Sasquatch, even if they differ on what Sasquatch is, even if they are completely obsessed with Sasquatch, but aren't full blown believers because, Hey, they haven't seen it. And you, I mean, for me personally, I'll know Sasquatch exists when I see it. And until then, I'm not interested in being one of these people who just says, I believe in something without seeing it with my own eyes, you know, but, but I know that I continue to be, I could, I continue to be compelled and I continue to just feel like the richness of that world. I, I, you know, my hope was that would bleed into the show. And so absolutely, you know, we want to talk to, to Gimlin. We want to talk to Meldrum and really just also just regular folks who you don't know their names. You know, the average person doesn't know their names. These are not, these are not famous names, but they're people who've had encounters. They are believable when you hear them tell it. Ah, the international Bigfoot conference. I didn't know we met there. Yeah. Russell, he, Russell Accord runs a tight ship on that. And I know it kind of got shut down with uh, this whole COVID thing. Uh, But that, you know, you captured that. You know, within the documentary, you captured the eyewitness, and that's what I really enjoyed. I think that's why the time goes by so quick. I mean, you're you're yanked off into different directions, but it's the whole of a story. It's not like you're losing it by going and talking to an eyewitness or bringing Bob Gimlin in or telling the history of Sasquatch around this murder mystery. It's very, very cool. Let me ask you, I ask everyone, and there's no wrong answer, but in your case, I'll ask it a different way. If Sasquatch exists, what do you think it is? For me, I, I think that if Sasquatch exists, I think it's I think it's a blood and gut creature. I I personally don't subscribe to an interdimensional being, but that's that's just me. Yeah, yeah. I I, I think that if it exists, it's uh you know some some offshoot of, of evolution. Yeah, and that's a fair answer, Josh. It's definitely a fair answer. And I really hope people go and check it out. It's on Hulu, a Hulu original uh, Sasquatch. And, you know, in the Bigfoot world, I guess Monster Quest is the best thing we got. This blows Monster Quest out of the water. And it really, after three episodes, it'll leave you wanting more. If you like it, please write Hulu. Uh, we need more of this stuff in this genre of Bigfoot. We need people taking it serious and and creating really cool content. It it pulls people into this subject. And uh, Josh, I can't thank you enough for coming on, man. Wes, thank you so much for having me and for your kind words. And uh, I want to leave with a shout out to Wayne and Georges who are who are in the doc series and are they're huge Sasquatch Chronicles fans. Thanks again, Wes, for for having me on. Sasquatch documentary on Hulu comes out in two days on 420. Hope you guys, uh, hope you guys get a chance to check it out. Hope you guys get a chance to uh, watch it. Uh, I'm sure, as you guys know, I I enjoyed it. I thought it was awesome. Uh, next up on the show, I want to welcome uh, Rob. Rob, thanks for coming on, man. Oh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's uh, my pleasure. 
Yeah, thanks again, Rob, for being here. And I know uh, you were a veteran up there in Canada. And even though it's not the United States, I'll still say thank you for your service. You guys are always over there uh, helping us, assisting us, and doing everything that we're doing. And so I, I always respect uh, a volunteer, especially a military volunteer. Uh, so thank you again for your service. I know that you had uh, four very strange encounters. Two of those were sightings. If you would, would you take us back to the first incident? Kind of tell us what you were doing and walk us into what happened. Uh, this happened uh, approximately, let's see, I was 14, 15, so 36 years ago. Um, I belonged to a group, uh, I joined back in junior high, and it was an adventure club. And we ski and hike um, from my hometown of Calgary, Alberta. And from Calgary, you can go south and you get rolling hills. You go north, you get foothills. You go east, you get rolling hills and and uh, prairies, and you go west. Like, I'm talking an hour in any direction, and you have the Rocky Mountains. So we have landscape everywhere. One of these trips that we did, <sighs> I just need to catch my breath here. And one of these trips that we did was out to uh, Exshaw Valley, which is approximately an hour east of west, sorry, west of Calgary on the way to Banff, I'm sure Banff is well known. And so our hiking group went out to Exshaw Valley and uh, we did hear a story at the time about the X Exshaw beast. They had told us this long before we went out there. And so, you know, you're going camping, fireplace stories. Uh, we got out there, um, dropped us off. There was probably a dozen of us. And we had to go back and we, we walked back into the, into the bush. Oh, I'm going to say a couple of kilometers. It wasn't that far. And we found a really nice stream and it seemed to be uh, fairly clean water. And, you know, 34 years ago, there was, there were, you don't, you don't, you know, you don't boil your water. You just fill up your canteen. So we slept beside the water, a dozen of us. We put a tarp down on the ground. We put a tarp up in the sky. And then we all slept under it just in sleeping bags. Uh, it, it's more, like I said, and it's a venture club. So there's no real niceties. It's whatever you carry on your back is what you bring. So we went to sleep. And I'm going to say it was dark. It was late. And something had woken me up. Um, we were laying on a little bluff on the other side of this little bluff from the water. Now it's a very small bluff, two feet, three feet maybe. And I woke up and I looked to my right and the fella that was sit sleeping beside me, his eyes were wide open. Like he was maybe six inches away from me. We were tightly packed and uh, he didn't say anything. I looked at him. I may have said something to him. I don't recall to tell you the truth. And then I heard two deep splashes, like splash, splash. And as I described to you yesterday, it's like somebody threw a giant boulder into the water. And when the rock hits the bottom, you get that metal clang, metallic clang. This didn't have a clang. So it was big, hard steps. And then two loud thumps on the ground. So whatever it was, walked, took two steps through the water, two steps on land and stopped. And the two steps on land, I wouldn't say it shook the ground, but I felt it. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I know a lot of eyewitnesses talk about that. They'll, I've had a lot on the show. They'll talk about being in a tent and hearing this thing walk towards their tent and they'll describe the ground shaking and I don't know that the ground is necessarily shaking. Maybe it's more like a tremor, I guess. That's that's kind of how it felt for me. It was a it was a tremor. It just is. It was such a heavy thump. Um, eventually, within the next few seconds or so, everybody woke up. Uh, all dozen of us, and we had instructors with us, and uh, you know they kind of took a look around the area. We didn't know what it was, and I didn't hear another sound. That was it for that night and for the rest of that trip. Um, didn't see anything. So that was, that was my 14 year old experience. Yeah. What did you think it was at the time, Rob? I mean, what did you think was going on? 
well, they had just told us about the XA beast, so I was sure it was the XA beast at 14 years old. I know it wasn't our counselors or anybody else because we were far enough in that um, that would have been a just a terrible joke at one o'clock in the morning. And not only that, but there's nobody I know that can walk that heavily on the ground. So I thought it was whatever the XA beast was. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Well, tell me about the uh, the next incident. How many years later did this happen? And uh, if you would, just kind of walk us into it. Kind of what were you doing? So it was the same group. Uh, it was two years, approximately two years later, and I was in high school. And uh, I was I just got home from high uh, from football practice. That's how I know I was in high school. Um, I'm going to say I was probably 16, so grade 10, grade 11. And we were going hiking out to this place called Fay Hut, which is in the interior of Alberta. I'm not exactly this sure, but I mean, if somebody needed to look, they could just Google Fay Hut uh, and it'll show you. So it's approximately, this is my recollection, it's approximately five kilometers in and two kilometers up. So we drove out there, nothing extra, about a three hour drive, four hour drive. We stop, we get all of our gear. They give us a briefing on where we're going to be walking. And we just, we walk along this pile for five kilometers. Didn't see anything. Then we get to the spot and we take a hard right. On the left is a, is a lake. And on the right hand side is a near up uh, vertical climb. Where we were going two kilometers up was to the base of a glacier where there's a cabin. And it's made for hikers and etc. And there was uh, probably about the same amount of people. So we spent the whole day going up there. Uh, we got into the cabin. It's just a big open floor. That's it. There's nothing else in there. So we all just threw our sleeping bags out. We kind of walked around for a little bit. Didn't want to go too far. We don't know the area. We don't know what's out there. Cougars, bears, etc. cetera, right? Um, and there's big bears up there. So we take a right at the bottom of the hill. And we start climbing up the hill. We go up. Uh, you know, we get up to the tent. We get all set up. Uh, sometime in the middle of the night, there was some racket going on outside and yelling, screaming. I'm not sure what it was. Counselors got up. They went outside. They told us to all stay in the tent or in the cabin, I should say. Um, and so we stayed in the cabin and we could hear noise outside. And it, they were only gone for maybe three to five seconds. And they all, kids came back in the door and the door was open and there was three of us kind of walked over to the door and they, the guys coming in were saying, there's a moose, there's a moose out front. And the, when they opened the, the counselors opened the door to come back in, we looked out. Now it's black, but it was fairly moonlit night that night. And 10 to 15 meters away, I think that's all it was up against the trees and kind of in within the trees was a massive white figure. I couldn't, I could make out the size, but I couldn't make out any features because it was so quick. I saw it. Three of us saw it. We were shocked. Then they pushed us, kind of pushed us back into the cabinet and, and shut the door. It was, it was eight feet, nine feet high. And, oh, I swear it looked, like it was four feet and it was very square. Um, almost like, a, like you would see on a, like a football player, wide shoulders, wide, wider waist, wide in the legs. Now where we were at deer, uh, I don't know if deer could even get up there. Deer couldn't moose. Absolutely. Even if there was any in the area, which I, I highly doubt, uh, Nothing, nothing of that type could get up to where we're at, you know, just with the rocks and everything. And that really put quite a fright into us. Uh, so we didn't really go anywhere. We stayed there for four nights and we, we didn't leave the tent after dark, <laughs> regardless of what the reasons were. And the rest of that trip kind of went uh, just quiet like that. Yeah, I want to ask you, so you see this thing standing up. Was it on two legs like a man? It was standing on two legs bipedal, and it was standing facing us with its arms to its side, almost like if you were to see a bouncer standing at a door. That's kind of what it looked like, just straight up, shoulders wide, arms out, like the figure I saw, 
that was it. It was just straight and and didn't make a sound, didn't do anything, you know. But once we shut the door, of course, we were all frightened. Yeah, and I, I'm not really sure what color it is. I have slight color blindness, so it's really hard to tell. But it was a light color. It wasn't dark. It was almost matched the surrounding uh, shale from the mountain because it's, it's kind of shale and rock and, or shale and trees in this area. So, but it, it, it kind of matched it. Now, again, this is nighttime and it's just reflections, right? So I don't really know what color it was. Yeah, I'm colorblind too. I have troubles with uh, reds and greens. <laughs> so do I. Yeah, me too. <laughs> and uh, darks. Yeah, it, it um, so did, do you think it just left? I mean, you guys closed the door. It was pretty much quiet the rest of the night. Uh, yes, for that night it was. Now, we did hear noises. Now, I, no, now come to think of it, we did hear noises throughout the few days, but, um, you know, most of the time they just say, ah, don't worry about it, that's elk. Don't worry about it, that's uh, it's mountain lion. Don't worry about it, it's this, it's this, it's this. And they just kind of talked off whatever it was. And, you know, we were not really scared. We were more excited as to all these sounds and stuff. Because I don't think we'd ever been in that deep in hiking. Yeah, I'd love to go back in time and know what you guys heard, you know, as far as the sounds go. I mean, uh, it was faint. Yeah, there were faint sounds at nighttime. Well, tell me, I know there's two other incidences we'll get to. Um, let me ask you, going back to this one we're talking about now, what did you think it was? I mean, with you see this thing, it's kind of light colored. It's obviously standing on two legs. What was your opinion as far as what, I mean, what did you think this thing was? Abominable snowman was the first thing that came to my mind to tell you the truth. When at 14, that's what I remember. Abominable snowman is standing out there because that's that's what it looked like to me. Like the abominable snowman out of uh, you know, the old Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer cartoon, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, with, with the abominable snowman. It kind of looked like that, just the face wasn't as I couldn't really see a face. It was just all fur or hair or whatever it is. Yeah, but that's the first thing I think. It was not a. It was not a moose. I've done quite a bit of hunting and hiking my whole life since I was a young kid. My brother's been taking me out, and it there was no moose. It was it, it, like I said, the abominable snowman, and I wasn't really sure what I was looking at. And it took me probably a decade to really, really realize what I saw because I know what I saw and I still have the picture in my head but you know it's like seeing something you've never seen before you don't know how to react and I had no idea <laughs> I thought maybe eventually I came to the fact absolutely Sasquatch yeah and I know that there was another time where you actually had a run-in a very close run-in with one uh, but before that happened there was kind of another weird incident that happened to you um, if you would, would you tell us how many years later it was and kind of walk us into it before we get to uh, you walking up on this thing in the middle of the night? Okay. Uh, so this is 10 years later, in 1996, and I was posted uh, from an Army base to an Air Force base out on Vancouver Island in Canada. And so my, my, current, my wife at the time and myself and her, her parents, we all came out in a motorhome and we camped along the ways. I've never been on Vancouver Island. I honestly had no idea. I was expecting to see just, just forest and, you know, something out of Australia outback. Then I got here and realized, no, it has roads and stuff. So... We were coming to, uh, I was supposed to CFB Comox, and we were going to be living in the Comox Valley. And we decided to go camping at this place called Comox Lake. So from Comox Valley to Comox Lake, it's approximately, I don't know, 15 minutes. And it's a municipal campground. So we went camping there. And we parked in the lower, there's a lower and upper, and we parked in the lower part. And... Uh, because we, my mother-in-law and father-in-law, they had the motor home and my, my wife at the time. And I think my son, he may have slept in the tent or, or in the motor home. So at one o'clock in the morning, um, I had heard what I thought was growling and, um, like a growl. I thought maybe there was a dog around or something. And, uh, this is a very packed campground. So. That's why I found it a little confusing. Like there's people everywhere. There's 
whatever. And so I listened to it and I couldn't really tell. So I, I asked, woke my wife up and I said, did, did you hear that? She said, yeah. I said, it sounds like growling. She's like, mm, it, it, yeah, it sounds like growling. She didn't care. So I crawled out of the tent and I went out and I sat and listened. Um, now I was in the army at that time. So I had been, you know, I think I just got out of the field. So, you know, used to sitting in the black and listening for things. So I stood there and listened and for about 15, 20 minutes or so, I heard howling, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a howl. Okay. First of all, we have no, we have no uh, wolves, coyotes, um, fox in this area. We only have black bears and cougars. I think that's that's the only two real ones we have on the island. There are no grizzly bears on the island. There are no moose on the island. You know, some things are not. Anyways, so I got out and the sound that I heard was a, it, it was low and it changed. So it was a, so it would change octaves. It would change levels, but it never changed octaves. And it just, and it was coming from the mountains behind me. I'm going to say a, easily a good kilometer away, but it was, it was very clear and it was very, not like anything I'd ever heard in all my years of being outside. And, uh, it, it was, it, it's, that one didn't freak me out as much as it just confused me because by that time I'm 26, a few things have been more on TV, you know, I'm still, I'm, I'm getting more into being a Sasquatch fan, but you know, my family and my military career came first. So it was really like, I think somebody said on one of the ones I read, armchair, uh, armchair researcher, um, and I started getting into um, John Bendernagle and Jeffrey Meldrum, Love Les Stroud. Um, and I started watching these guys because they seem very legitimate. And they that's how I figured out that that wasn't anything else, screaming out in that forest. Because I really wanted to know. My first time on the island, I, I don't know what's out here. It could be Madagascar. Right. So uh, that's when I started reading. The first thing I came up was, you know, John Binder Nagel. And then I started reading a little more, a little more, a little more, a little more. Plus, I have a couple of John Green's books I have read. I don't know if I mentioned that before, but uh, yeah. So I started getting a little bit more information about it. And that's when I went, OK, you know what? That thing I saw back at Fay Hut and the thing I saw there, that's 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 got to be a Sasquatch. Yeah, very strange, especially not being able to pinpoint that noise. Uh, did anything else happen while you were camping there? Uh, no, it just it went on. Well, no, that's not true. Just the, the the howling went on and off throughout the night for the remainder of the night. Just at about every, I don't know, seemed like about every hour and a half, every two hours, and I would hear that again. Yeah, that's very strange. I think in a lot of those situations that – it's so odd it stays with us. I think if it would have been a natural animal, it wouldn't have stayed with you. And I know you served in the Army, uh, in the Canadian Army, and you know, you're know you a veteran, and you guys have been out in the woods. You guys have heard all kinds of weird things. I don't think it would have stuck with you like it did after all these years. Uh, tell me about the last incident. Um, when did this happen, Rob? 2003, summer 2003. I just finished... Um um, the last 18 months or so doing tours and training. And my son was here in the Valley with his mom and stepdad. And I, him and I always do things together, but because I didn't get much of a chance, we went camping a lot that summer. So I took my son and his, uh, his, um, buddy, I'll just call my son R and my, and his buddy B. So it was, it was, a nice camping trip. We'd gone up to the Comox Lake. This is the same Comox Lake. You have the bottom where I had the howling in 96. And then you have the top part. Now in the top part, there is, there's, it's tenting only, it's dry camping. And it's very small, a lot more trees because it kind of butts up against the mountain a little bit. 
there is some space like it doesn't go straight up from from there but is you know it, it slowly climbs out and in, up into the mountains at the back of the campgrounds and so you don't generally get a lot of people there a lot of times um most people stay down low because that's where the beach is is crowded and they get snack bars but then you go up top and you're you're in a completely different park so we had set up the tents um parked the car we had all the room in the world because there's nobody else camping so we just kind of i parked the parked the truck in one set the tent up in another and then we put the fireplace right beside it um we had it was just the three of us and we had spent the whole day there and between there and and the water which was a 10 minute walk in the lake and we would come back and forth and then you know mid-afternoon the boys were done so they just spent the day playing now where our campsite was there was a camps there was three four five campsites and behind on one end of the campsite one side of the campsite is a a hill that's raised and on the other side of the hill is um bush and forest and then it goes back in to the front of the campsite is just the the road uh, or that goes around the campsite. So uh, I'll jump forward here a little bit. I'm sorry. I'm a little nervous. I'm uh, just trying to catch my breath. All right, you're doing fine, man. Um, so we went camping. Uh, we spent the evening there uh, just playing around, doing, you know, campfire games with the ki- with the boys. And I was teaching them how to, you know, use an axe and a hatchet and a knife and light fires and just just doing what I can because my brother and my dad taught me and I wanted to pass that on to my son. And now my son, I just became a grandpa last week. So now my son's going to pass it on to his son. It was late at night and they were in the tent and they had just gone to bed and I walked out and uh, I sat down beside the fire and I stoked the fire up a little bit because there's nobody else around. High trees wasn't, it wasn't really a fire issue probably about an hour after the kids had gone to bed and I'm just sitting out by myself. Uh, I hear daddy, daddy. And I said, yes, son walked over to his tent and zipped it up. And he said, daddy, I hear growling. I said, you hear what? (laughs) I hear growling. So I look around and there's, there's nothing around us. And frankly, you know, it's a nine-year-old's attention, I think is what it was, dreamt it or something else. I said, okay, son, I'll go take a look at it. Okay, Dad, but you got to go to bed. You put your head down. And it was like, okay. So I, I zipped the zipper down. I said, Dad's going to go get it for you. So I got my hatchet. I'm telling him what I'm doing. And he's like, okay, Daddy. And then, you know, that was it. So I grabbed my hatchet. I had a hatchet in one hand, right hand. I had a flashlight in my left hand and I also had a buck knife with me, like a great big one, uh, just on my hip. Uh, the kids get a kick out of it. I don't really use it for anything, but the kids get a kick out of it. <clears throat> so I'm walking down the little road, um, with my flashlight. Um, now there's the, the flicker of the fire against the trees and because there's no other vehicles, it goes down quite far. And, uh, so I walk down, I'm flashing my life light to the left. I'm looking in the first campsite, second campsite, behind the campsites. There's nothing back there. I know there's nothing back there. There's a tree. So I get to about the third campsite, and there's a tree. As I walk around the side of the tree, I am face-to-face with, as I described to you yesterday, I was as shocked as if you came around the corner in a grocery store and saw uh, Red Angus bull, thousand pound bull staring at you. That is the shock I got. What I saw was two eye shine. Um, I didn't flash the light directly into its eyes because, well, that I didn't need to. It as I was bringing the flashlight up, that's when I saw the eyes, and I stopped at whatever angle that was. I'm going to say about thirty, probably about thirty degrees down, uh, six degrees down. Sorry, thirty degrees up. And it was very wide. It was, its head was twice the size of mine. I could make out the size of its shoulders. 
which were, and I'm, I'm a big guy. I'm, I'm six foot three, 310 pounds. And this thing just made me look like a, a, a rag doll. It was 10 feet away. I'm going to say roughly 10, 10 to 15 feet. Everything's close. So as I'm, I, I, I see this, it's, slowly, I know you hear this a lot, rocking back and forth, very slowly. So it rocked one side, the other, one side, the other. And when it came back to the other side, two small eyes poked out from the side of it. It was the same exact same color eyes, kind of a almost an amber, amber to red from what my colorblind eyes see. <laughs> so, you know, it could have been green, purple. So when I saw that, I, I, up to that point, my fear level was about a nine out of 10. After that, it was about a 15. Because as you and I had talked about, this was a probably a, a, a parent with an offspring. And the last thing you want to do in the forest is run into an animal with a parent and an offspring. Pretty much anything is going to hold you back. So I, I was definitely frozen. I didn't hear anything. I didn't smell anything. But I saw these two things. And the one on the back, it looked like it was hanging on to the shoulders. Or it was extremely tall i measured so where i was standing and the, there was a stump and the head was above the stump the shoulders were wider than the stump when i walked over to the other side there's an a, an indent a gully that dropped about five feet in that exact spot and then behind there is a path that goes right into the forest because the road ends by that point and it goes right into the forest. So I'm watch I went and looked at it. Now I saw this the next day, not that night. So I was petrified. Um, I slowly started walking backwards. I kept my eyes down, but looked up. So I kept my eyes face down, but I just kept my eyes looking up because I wanted to keep an eye on what this thing was doing. So from the time I walked around, saw the first one, that was probably five to 10 seconds. Then the second one came off, and that was about another three seconds. And then that's when I decided that I would no longer wanted to be there. And I feared for the kids because these two boys are nine years old, and we're in the middle of nowhere, and the gate's locked. And we're not in the middle of nowhere, but um, I walked backwards the 30, 40 feet back to my trailer, just shaking, or back to the fire pit. I stoked the fire pit up, and I strategically put my chair down so that we had a vehicle on one side of the tent, the fire was on another corner of the tent, and my chair was on the other corner of the tent. So the boys were kind of in the middle in the tent, and I stayed up all night long with a hatchet in one hand and a, my buck knife in the other hand, and just, I swear I flicked my head at every sound. It, it was a nerve-wracking night, and... Uh, the only way I was able to relax is that a, a uh, another person group came in first thing in the morning, about eight o'clock or so, and set up a tent literally r right across the road from us, 20 feet away. So I said, boys, boys had gotten up and said, boys, don't go anywhere. Stay right here. Don't go swimming. Don't go anything. They're very good kids. So they're, they're not going to listen to anything. And we're in a very safe area. So I don't have to worry about somebody taking them away. I said, I'm going to sleep. I went to sleep for a short time, woke up, packed up, left. <laughs> And well, that's not true. I did that. So when I woke up, I went back and looked in that area. So it's daytime now, quite lit. lit. And I, that's when I walked back over in that area, like, what the hell did I see? And that's when I saw the, the, the approximately five foot drop. My head came to about the level of the ground. And the thing I saw as head was at least two, four, two feet above that. It didn't have a cone head, but it wasn't really rounded. It was uh, almost flatter. 
if I could say that. Um, I could see the size of it. So I had the whole outline of it. I could see the muscles and I could make out the face, the nose a little bit, the lips a little bit because they were a little bit lighter and the eyes, well, they never changed. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's the, that was my experience. Yeah, it's a very fascinating account, Rob. I really appreciate you taking the time to share it. And as you and I talked about, that behavior always fascinates me. I don't know if it's females or I can't quite figure it out. You know, if you come across a black bear with her cubs, you're dead. You come across a cougar with its young, you're dead. Pretty much anything in the forest you come across and they have their young with them, uh, they're going to kill you. And what's weird about Sasquatch is... That doesn't necessarily happen. A lot of times they seem to just kind of stand there and watch you. Uh, it's a very fascinating account. What do you what do you think that they are, Rob? What's your opinion? Oh, I think it's the missing link. I think it's uh it's it, it's not well, I know what I saw and what I saw was flesh and blood. Uh I think it's a uh like a lot of people do. I think it's a it's a uh, bipedal uh shoot off of you know homo sapiens at some point or however that works <laughs> uh that's what that's what i think it i think it's an animal i think it's an animal doing what a, doing exactly what animals do because we were there all day long and so we made a ruckus on the top of this hill i think it was watching us during the day and and or at night time it came to watch us and we i just happened to catch it watching us that's what i think it was doing yeah you could be right I mean, you could be right, Rob. I, I hope you're right. And uh, I can't thank you enough for, I know you're nervous coming on, and and uh, but you did great. And I, I really appreciate you taking the time and effort to kind of recount what happened to you in your life, man. And, and thank you so much for your service. I know, hey, the Canadians, Americans, uh, at the end of the day, we're all people. We're all on the same side. And thank you so much for your service. Oh, thanks, Wes. I appreciate it. This has been the highlight of my my life. I've been wanting to tell this story since I was, since it happened and have it recorded and official. And I thank you Wes for that. Thanks again, Rob, and take care of yourself. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. To get a chance to check out sasquatchchronicles.com, you can become a member and get additional shows. Until next time, everyone.